Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very welcome to tonight's webinar on the Better Farm Beef Challenge Northern Ireland. My name is Adam Woods, Beef Editor with the Irish Farmers Journal, and over the next hour or so, we hope to bring you some of the key messages that we have learned from the Better Farm programme over the last four to five years and tell some of the stories of the journeys of the participants along the way. The programme farmers have managed to lift their gross margins by 67% over the course of the programme, so it's well worth tuning into. I'm delighted to be joined by Daryl Boyd, Francis Breen, Oliver McKenna, Alistair McNeely, and Barry Carty. The format for the night is that we will hear from Daryl Boyd and Francis Breen, two of the programme advisors who have worked closely with the farmers over the last few years, and what they take on the programme, what their take on the programme was. I'll then speak to three of the programme farmers, Oliver McKenna, Alistair McNeely and Barry Carty, about some of the changes that have taken place on their farms over the last few years. First up, we will go to Francis and Darrell for some background to the programme and some of the latest performance results. OK, thanks, Adam. And firstly, on behalf of CAFRE, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of the programme partners, the, the Irish Farmers Journal, ABP Food Group, and of course, all of the farmers who have participated in the programme since 2011. All of these partners, I think, have ensured that the programme delivered against its objectives. So going back to 2011, when the programme was launched, we aimed to recruit 10 circular farmers from across Northern Ireland who were really receptive to taking on board technologies which would lead to an improvement in their profitability. We developed development plans for each farm, and these were delivered by one-to-one -one advice uh, from a dedicated advisor and from a group discussion model. The aim was to develop these farms to achieve a gross margin of at least £750 per hectare. The reason per hectare was used is because land is the most limiting resource on the majority of circular farms in Northern Ireland. Therefore, it makes sense to try and get a metric which achieves the maximum return on, on this resource. Gross margin was used rather than net profit because gross margin is much more reflective of the technical efficiencies being delivered in an enterprise. Gross margin is essentially sales and output, less grassland, purchased feed and veterinary costs, whereas net profit includes fixed costs such as machinery and building depreciation. And these fixed costs can vary significantly depending upon the stage of the development and level of investment taking place in a farm at any one time. But based on information that fixed costs are generally in the region of £500 per hectare, achieving a gross margin of £750 per hectare would leave a net profit of £250 a hectare or £100 an acre. And again, if we achieved a gross margin of £1,000 a hectare, that had the potential to leave a profit of £500 a hectare or £200 an acre. And then we wanted to communicate the journey that each of these farmers was, was on. And we wanted to highlight what technologies were being adopted in the farms and were successful. And we did this weekly through press articles in the Irish Farmers Journal. We had a number of farm walks and conferences. And even over the past year, we had virtual farm walks and webinars, which were very well attended. And just thought I'd show this map, which shows the locations of some of the of where some of the farms were situated across Northern Ireland. We have a farm which is Barry Carty. As far left here is Garrison, very challenging land type. The farm in Port or Rush, and then as far as east as down in Patrick, and really everywhere in between. So we had farms which were representative of different land types within Northern Ireland and also different enterprise sizes. And then using this graph, I think it's worthwhile to look at the impact of the program on the participating farms and also highlight what the potential for other farms could potentially be. And to put this in the context, I've also looked at the performance of other circular beef farms, which have been benchmarked by CAFRI over the past 10 years. And every year, CAFRI carries out financial benchmarking on over 300 circular beef farms. And the results of these can be, can be put into a metric of gross margin per hectare, as shown here in this graph. When ranked by this metric, we can classify farms as being in the average or in the top 25% categories, as shown by the green and the purple lines. The green line clearly shows that over the past 10 years, really with the exception of 2018, the average suckler farmer has, faced, has failed to make a, a sufficient gross margin per hectare 
to cover fixed costs if fixed costs were 500 pounds a hectare and leave a significant profit. In contrast, those ranked in the top 25% of benchmark farms have generally always delivered a gross margin to enable a profit. In each phase of the program, we aim to recruit farmers who fell into the average category. The dark blue line represents the farms in phase one, the red line in phase two, and the light blue line then those farms who were involved in phase three of the program. In each of the phases, uh, through the execution of a development plan, we've taken these farms from placed in the average category up to the top 25% of producers. And we can see in 2020, those farms which were involved in phase three of the program have developed from just under 600 pounds a hectare up to over a thousand pounds a hectare over a four year period. So what has been the main drivers of this? Well, we know that grazed grass and, and grass conservatives forage are the cheapest feed sources for cattle. So if we could grow and utilize more of this resource across each hectare, then in theory, we'd be able to carry more stock and deliver a higher output and gross margin. And we can see here across each of the three phases, those farms have went from an average of 1.67 cow equivalents in phase one, up to over two cow equivalents in phase two, and actually even after the program went up as far as 2.5 cow equivalents per, per hectare. And a similar trend occurred in phase two and phase three of the program. So leading on from this, I thought it was interesting to show graphically the correlation between stock and rate and gross margin per hectare. So down along the left-hand side, we have gross margin per hectare, and down, and down along the bottom, we have stocking rate. And each of the blue dots represents a benchmark farm, but over 300 in this sample. This graph clearly shows, using a linear correlation, that as stocking rate increases, so too does the gross margin per hectare. Indeed, this figure of 0.45 suggests that stocking rate accounts for about 45% of the differences shown here in, in gross margin per hectare. However, when we look at the graph a little bit closer, we can see there are some outliers. Some farms down here at the bottom are carrying a higher stocking rate without getting the benefit of improved gross margin per hectare. And when we look at that a little bit deeper, the predominant reason for this is that the extra stocking rate being achieved in these farms is a result of purchased feed as opposed to home growing grass and forage. And our experience would be that to, that to carry a stocking rate of over two cow equivalents per hectare profitably, those farms would need to be growing and utilizing greater than 10 tons of dry matter per hectare, which is what these farms up here in the top category are achieving. So increased stocking rate must be as a result of increased grass growth and utilization. To put cow equivalents in, this, in, in the context, um, one, one cow equivalent per hectare is equivalent to carrying approximately one cow and calf outfit for every two and a half acres, whereas a stocking rate of two and a half cow equivalents per hectare is equivalent to carrying one cow and calf unit for every one acre. <clears throat> but we have to be mindful that the majority of suckler cow farms, as we outlined earlier, are in less favoured areas. But carrying this level of stock is not always feasible or possible. Many of these farms achieving one and a half cow equivalents per, per, per hectare will, will most likely be their limit. This leaves those farms in a position where achieving a sufficient gross margin per hectare to leave the farms profitable is a challenge. And we can see that, that these farms in the region of, they're carrying a stocking rate in the region of one and a half cow equivalents per hectare, they're generally not, not achieving a gross margin of much more, much more than six or 700 pounds a hectare, whereas we see those farms that are carrying two and a half, two to two and a half cow equivalents per hectare are achieving a much higher gross margin per hectare. That means those farms which are falling within that one to one and a half cow equivalents per hectare have little room for, for any other inefficiencies. So it's critical that each of these farms ensure that each cow equivalent, which is being maintained, is efficient as possible in terms of output. So I'm now going to pass over to Daryl Boyd, who's the current program advisor, who will look at some of the physical efficiency metrics which we concentrated on program farms. So I'll pass over to Daryl now. Thank you. So thanks. Um, yeah, so as, as Francis said, 
Uh, stock and rate, very highly correlated to improving gross margin uh, on a per hectare basis. Uh, but what about those farms uh, in NA, NA that can sustain stocking rates of two cow equivalents per hectare? The reality is a lot of farms that have suck cows may struggle to keep a cow uh, stocking rate of one and a half cow equivalents. On those farms, they really have to, to focus on getting the most out of each cow and need to be asking themselves the questions, the types of questions that's on screen at the minute um, to identify are they doing that. Um, but the most important thing is to know what the targets are, realistic targets, um, and what needs to be done to get to there. And really, a cow has two functions, and that's to get in calf, calf that calf living, and, and grow that calf as much as she can. And I'm just going to talk about some of the main um, KPIs that we look at in, in the program over the last number of years to reflect that. The first one is fertility and calving index. You can see here national average in NI sitting around 415. Uh, for the group members, it's been improved to 372 days in 2020. So what does that difference of 43 days actually mean um, in the Calvin index? These are costs from the benchmark farms in 2020 within the program. Feeding an empty cow comes to 17 pounds uh, over those 43 days. Lost calf growth 123 pounds. So total cost is 140 pounds per head um, if those farms were to slip from their current position to the national average when you take the amount of cows calving for the second time on those farms on a per herd basis within the program slipping the national average would cost just under eight thousand pounds to the farm and for me that's moving from a chance of profit to no chance of profit the other areas we look at uh, within fertility are calving spread, scanning percentage, and scanning the weaning. And we break these figures down in this way so that we can actually put our finger on what's going wrong uh, in order to correct it. Calving and spreads, uh, calving spread is important for, for having uniform batches of animals at dosing, at times of vaccination, and at housing. You don't want to be housing, you know, bulls with 200 kilos of difference together. Um, so the program average there in 2020 is down to 10 weeks, uh, a range between 7 and 12 weeks, but it's not far away from where we want it to be. Scanning percentage within a defined breeding period for me is really the true test of fertility. And we have a target at 95%. Not easy to achieve, but as you can see from the range, there are farms that are able to achieve it, but our average is sitting at 93%. You know, And when we have that figure, we can really look back and say, you know, were cows too fat, were cows too thin at calving, at breeding? Was there a mineral, imba mineral imbalance? What went wrong? And we can correct it. Scanning the weaning then is important then too, that we have low levels of mortality. Um, and we have a percentage or a target there of 95%. Again, we're sitting at 93%. Uh, by the time you take uh, fetal losses, losses in around the calving time, and from then on to weaning. Um, so... But it is achievable, as you, as you can see there, we have had 100 farms sitting at 100% this year, um, but on average sitting at 93%. But very difficult uh, in reality to achieve 90% of what was went to the bull, but that is a realistic target and it should be a target that we're striving to, towards. Second part of the jobs cow is to, to grow that calf through milking ability and the genetics for growth that she's passed down to it. And we have a 200 day growth rate of 1.2 kilograms per day target. We're sitting just under that in 2020, but we're very happy sitting at 1.19. Again, a huge range there. And that's really important for the likes of a bull beef system. You want as much weight gain on that calf before weaning. And we're seeing differences there from one farm to the next of up to 70 kilos of males at 200 days of age. And that all has to be made up with the concentrate or, or the male bill uh, after weaning. So the more we can get on, while, while before weaning, the better. We look at weaning percentage as well, which is the calf weight divided by cow weight at 200 days of age. It's a very crude figure. It can be skewed depending on the amount of, of, of heifers uh, calving down in any particular year, body condition score of cows. But it's a good figure to look at within a herd from one year to the next. And all we're trying to do is identify the, the worst performing animals, call them, identify the best, 
breed from them and move the average of the population within a herd forward year on year. And when you rank cows based on weaning percentage, you'll find very heavy cows at the bottom. You'll find moderate sized cows at the bottom, but you'll always see the, the, the worst performing animals have very, very low daily labor gains in their calves. And if a cow is sitting there year after year, it's a good enough reason to color in my eyes. And of course, we've got lifetime carcass gains as well. Um, because you know you need that growth as well coming from the cow. So we look at our bull system there, 0.85 is our target. We're sitting at 0.82 in 2020, but there are a number of farms that are consistently achieving uh, above the target of 0.85. So, you know, it is possible, uh, and that's what we're striving uh, for to bring that whole average up there. Steers sitting just under the target of 0.55. In reality, you know, with all the, the good stuff in place in terms of silage quality, grassland management, three to four years is a very short time to change genetics on a farm. And in reality, the, the changes that we've brought onto the farms in terms of trying to introduce a bit more maternal genetics into the cows, it's going to take time to, to bring those averages up and make those changes on farm. But Adam, that's just a few of the KPIs that we look at on a per cow basis within the program. And it's something that irrelevant of soil type Every farm can identify where they are uh, and make new goals to, to try and improve their own situation. Okay, back to you, Adam. Thank you. Thanks to Daryl and Francis for that overview. And I know that they will join us for questions in our question and answer session at the end. We'll now move on to the three program farmers. Earlier this week, I caught up with them and asked them about their experience over the last four to five years. We'll kick off with Barry Carty. Okay, I'm delighted to be joined now by Barry Carty uh, in, from Garrison uh, in County Fermanagh. Uh, Gary, Bar Barry, uh, sorry, you're very welcome uh, tonight. Thanks, um, I guess, I suppose, to give us a little bit of a picture, uh, Barry, uh, around, I suppose, what your farm, and you're farming in a beautiful part of the country, but, but it's quite a difficult part of the country. I know I'm not that far away from you, so I know all about it. Uh, tell us a little bit about your farm and, and farming system. Yeah, we're in West Fermanagh here, um, Adam, heavy, heavy clay soils and plenty of, plenty of it. Plenty of uh, heather and bog as well, but uh, just making the most of what you have, really. And um, just was maybe started the program was on 30, 40 cows now, I'm up with 60, 60, 65 cows, just uh, trying to run them very tight ship, just to, and uh, increase the output as much as possible, you know. So the system is uh, is selling weanlands. Tell tell me a little bit about cow type and 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 maybe bull type that you're using uh, on the farm. Cow type was uh, uh, really continental cross there, Charlie, Cemental, Limousine, maybe a bit of Hereford in there too, just um, getting away from maybe at the start of the program was a heavy, too heavy a cow, 700 kilo, getting back to our, maybe later at cow, easier on the land, 620 averaging there, and trying to wean it close to 50%, 45% for uh, your calves. And um, that's, that's the, you know, the cow type, and uh, just the bull selection there, Went 100% uh, AA, just using mainly all terminal Charlie. For all Jason, uh, sort of fist and fist as well. But Rory Jason's a, a stretchier, uh, higher calf. He has the same confirmation as fist but the, he's doing well. He's a, he's a stronger calf, you know. In terms of getting cow weight down from that 700 kilos back to, to 620, um, was that a bit of a job or, or how did you go about doing that? Are you, are you choosing different bulls or, or how are you bringing, or choosing different breeds maybe, or how are you bringing that back? I just um, constant, all EA all and then just kind of bring in, bring in replacements at the start of the start of program probably buying in replacements. And uh, it's very hard sometimes to get them to walk too well. You bring from east to west. It's not often that things, you know, go, Crave that well in the West, you know, where any kind of a softness animal. So just come back to breeding our own and kind of picking what you breed, you know, 100% EA, um, picking some uh, cemental and limousine, a bit of sex semen to try and get on a, on um, later cows just to try and keep the weight there, you're not getting too big an animal, you know. Um, you mentioned there going, we'll say, 100% AI, and that was one of the changes that you made. Um, has that been very difficult for, for the farm or, or in terms of heat detection and things like that? Have you any tips out there for, for people maybe that want to do more AI? How have you coped with that? Yeah, well, at the start, at the start I was uh, just doubling AI myself, but then just taking the plunge and going 100% AI with the bulls, Charlie Bulls, and you're on a fragmented farm and trying to get them seven places, then I get cows and calves was next to impossible. 
So that's why I just went to, I'm AA now 100% in the shed there, the autumn's AA there. Um, the autumns are born um, end of July, August and September, and then they're AA uh, uh, November, December there. Uh, as for getting them, seeing them there, well, it's all, they've always been cam- cameras in the shed, which has picked, made it easier to pick them up when they were using the, the scratch cards. But sometimes there, you you can be thrown out a bit by them and give you the wrong cow or something, too many cows jumping. So last year I got in, I had uh, kept on looking strokes. I had I kept three teaser bulls, which worked out to be a very good job. And in terms of, I guess, you know, in terms of checking those cows, how often are you checking them in the shed? Or are you, are you, if they're on the camera, are you able to check them there a couple of times during the day if you're away from the sheds or whatever? Ah, yeah, from away. If you have 4G, you can check them check them three or four times. And there's, most activity is, is, is late at night or early in the morning when there's kids up anyway, so it's not hard to flick on the phone or the camera on the phone and you can you can see what's going on, you know, what, uh, what you need to look at later on. But generally, the, you'll see that these are both be very sweaty after some animal, you know, whether they be warm, you'll, they're not that hard to pick up with, the, with these are both. So you've adapted your system to make sure that your AI and before animals go to the shed to leave it, because you're working on a fragmented farm, it makes sense for you to do that. In terms of keeping condition on cows between sort of calving and breeding, how are you managing to do that? Or how do you, how do you ensure that they don't lose too much condition between calving and breeding? As was the biggest challenge was making enough quality silo in this country. You're, um, you know, there's plenty of poor silo, and I have still um, some midlands midland stuff. But I, I got into uh, the fields. I um, the main side is blocking in home here in Garrison and Glen. I have it well drained, and and uh, it's been receded. It's been uh, receded twice, so it's. Uh, it's growing pretty good grass and they're getting um, very, very good silage there. It was, uh, I think it was 73 there, the last stuff was analyzed. Keeping them on good silo and um, uh, in the breeding season there, they have a kilo, kilo and a half of a high energy beef mix and um, a dozen of um, a good mineral on top of that too. Making that really good silage, like is it was it just about drainage or or is it about soil fertility? Is it about receding? Is it about cutting at the right time? Um, you know, you're you're again you're on tough country and and it's hard to make good silage in tough country. How how, yeah. how did you manage to do that? Well, it's, it's, it's all them things added together. Really, you start for me before I joined the program. I, I had kind of been into doing a bit of work on on soil and on the background of it and just uh, working on the soil the pH building it up slowly with a small bit of lime each year. You can't even. So that of the one year you you soften the ground too much, but uh, uh, maybe sowing a bit of pea fertilizer at the back end of the year, make sure your pea, uh, peas and peas is right, and then just uh, probably getting the sheep the meadows head off with sheep, and then getting an early cold slurry, and um, just feeding the grass or the, what it was what it needs best fertilizer, just picking the best fertilizer on the on the back of the side results, and then getting a cut early, which is maybe people think you're mad cutting here and there. 15, 20 to me, but you have to go early to get high quality silage. Uh, in terms of if you, stu- if you stood back and looked at, we'll say, the last four or five years on the farm, give me the easiest thing you've done or the thing that you should have been doing maybe before you joined the programme and give me the hardest thing that you, you found to change uh, over those four or five years. So the, so the very easy thing and, and, the, and the very hard thing over the last four or five years. Well, probably the... The easiest when you're talking about uh, getting uh, charry bulls going off their feet and stuff and not going in fertile. And that the easiest thing was actually to switch to the AA just when you're when you decided just to have everything AA in the shed. The, the autumn ones are AA from um, November, December. Now my spring is calved. They're 20, 25 is calved. And then I'm in the middle of AA and I'm at the minute I have 20 out of 33 AA. That was when you just make the take the plunge and say you're going to do it. The switching to AA worked out to be the best, best and the easiest to manage. And then and one, of, one of the hardest things for you to do? Probably one of the hardest things was uh, getting the grass into shape. You know, it's not a simple job when you know when you, you start to take into the draining fields. In this country, four or five lower stones an acre is a minimum. Yeah. And then uh, uh, grass seed after you probably turn over. I'd end up, I didn't plough the, the last time because you end up ploughing up clay, just pouring it off and stitched in grass seed, which work, works, it seems to work well in this country because you, if you start a plough, you end up ploughing down that small bit of soil that you have on top. 
just finally, uh, Barry, in terms of looking at your sales figures, like you've, you've had phenomenal performance there in terms of if, if we look at 2016, you were selling sort of 350 kilo calves for 662 in terms of pounds per head. Um, in, in 2020, you've lifted that to 435 and you're up at 231 uh, pence per kilo, uh, 1,005 a head. Has that just been a function of, we say, switching to AI, or is there other things at play there? Are you keeping animals longer? Are you keeping animals moving better? Is there is there no store period uh, with your animals, or what's driving those sales figures? Just to say that that's it's a combination of all them things. Just uh, it's really at the start. We um, just look at the, at the, enjoying the program and just the output wasn't you know, all you have here is what you can sell and uh, with the stocking rate. 1.2, probably only half of what the other farmers up the country are getting their stocking rate. You have to maximize what you're selling. So we're uh, selling too late at Weanland, wasn't getting the best, getting the most out of them. So we ended up just um, keeping them on longer, uh, feeding them good quality silage and, and giving them a kilo, kilo and a half a meal. And then just over the winter time, we're growing, uh, I suppose, the minute doing about 1.7 a day on cows, the autumn ones, and the heifers are doing 1.3 this last few months. And now, um, I'll be able to pick out the best of them, sell them probably for grass men now shortly. If a uh, fella's going to grass in direct, and then the later ones, I have one grazing farm fairly well drained and set up the paddock grazing, rotational grazing, so try and keep them on good grass this summer and get a bit more weight on them for sale. I suppose for the next five years, where where, where is Barry Carty going? Or, or um, he's probably staying in garrison, but but where where is the farm going? Maybe for the next couple of years, in terms of what's the plan? Or what what is there is there more changes to be made? If you're it's, uh, in this kind of area, you're you're on this type of land. You're always improving and, and trying to make things a bit better. There's always there's always things to do. There's training to do and improving grassland and and, and uh, whatever extra grass you can grow you can definitely utilize it if you if you have the right quality and grass and you have animals for it just trying to push the stocking rate as, as much as possible on this uh, on this wet land even carry a few extra cattle over the winter you know they can do well inside the, the, the pretty good housing that they can uh, perform pretty well so that's um, just pushing the stocking rate and seeing what you do with that Okay, Barry, thanks very much for joining us. Look, at you deserve huge credit uh, for the changes you've made over the last number of years. I know your system was one that I personally followed at home because um, maybe it's, it's more like the system at home uh, and in terms of working on tough ground and, and a Weanland system. And I'm sure there are lots of farmers out there that followed you as well over the last number of years. And as I said to the other uh, participants, you know, you deserve huge credit uh, making mistakes out there in public view and, and in the Farmers Journal every week about that, along with the successes. Um, and look, at thanks very much for joining us tonight. And we're going to go now to a few questions. And if you can join us for those few questions, that'd be great. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Adam. OK, I'm delighted to be joined now by Oliver McKenna, uh, Escra, County Tyrone. Um, Oliver, uh, you're maybe not the oldest uh, in the programme, but you're definitely maybe uh, one of the longest uh, in the, the Northern Ireland Better Farm programme. Um, tell me a little bit about your farm, Oliver, and maybe the farming system. Uh, just a bit, a bit of a brief background for our, for our viewers here tonight. Uh, thanks for introduction, Adam. Um, basically, running the structure cow system, where we're uh, concentrating on maternal breeding and finishing the males as young bulls. A uh, lawn type is very variable with some reasonably good areas, you know, and, and it changes very quick into very poor land. And uh, we would be trying to push the better areas as much as possible with the grazing and, and taking as much out of them as we can. Um, running uh, half and half spring and autumn calving, uh, spring cows calving, March, April and autumn cows calving, uh, August, September. T take us right back, Oliver, I guess, back to 2013. It's a long time ago now, but, but in terms of, I suppose, why... Why did you get involved in the program, or was it somebody twisted your arm to get into it, or was it something you wanted to get into, or you know how how did it come about? Just that that, that you're in the program. Well, I think uh, Francis had taken over the program at at that stage, of maybe a year or two, and uh, then it was looking to be um, renewed, and he mentioned it to me, and I thought about it for a while, and uh, I had followed the program previous to that, you know, so I thought it would be good enough to get involved with. Um so uh, 2013 we joined, we had just started to rent about an extra 30 acres and um, the plan there was to build up cows, 
cow numbers to 60 cows, keep concentrating on the maternal breeding so that we were breeding all within our own herd and um, to, you know, push the, push the grazing and push the grass the best we could, get get the stocking rate increased. And um, I suppose back to 2013, it, it demonstrates that, you know, uh, you don't, the suckler system needs a wee bit of time to get it, to get it up, especially if you're trying to build numbers and that. Um, you could have pushed the stocking rate faster, but I suppose you're just going to have to go out and buy cows and uh, that, that, facility wasn't there I, you know I, would, I had to just take it gradually um, it, it's a really long process isn't it when you're when you're going down that road of breeding your own replacements like you're nearly from decisions made today of straws going into cows you're nearly four or five years away from making a sale of the female that'll come off that straw so it's, it's a really long term plan that isn't it i and you'll be you'll be nearly assured that you'll get more bulls than <laughs> heifers when you're looking heifers and you'll yeah. be the other way about now but yes um <clears throat> But when you get the system settled, you know what, it, it is easier. And uh, now we would have more stock to sell because we're not retaining as many heifers. And um, I suppose that's starting to pay off. And it, it, it shows that it, it just, you can make a lot of improvements in three years or four years, but you double that up, you really see the benefit of the things you're putting in place. So give me, give me, we'll say, take a step back, right, and give me the three biggest changes you made to your farming system over the last six to eight years. I suppose there's been, I'm sure there's been loads of changes, but but what's been the three maybe biggest ones? And I'm going to go on then to maybe what was the hardest one and what was the easiest one. But just for now, what was what was what were the big things? I suppose that the lads identified or that he identified that that should be done on your farm. Well, the first thing would be we would have went from in 2013 100% use of stock bulls till now 100% use of AI. Um, and the second thing would have been increasing the stocking rate and along that um, improving the grassland management in that we would have been, you know, starting to use paddocks and stuff. We would have improved that a fair bit and on top of that building the fertility in the soil. And, and keeping up receding and sort of bringing all that together. So, so, so of those things, what's, what's the easiest? What, 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 what would you have said, gee, I should have been at this years ago before these lads came along. I should have been doing this. What, what was the most easiest thing you, you've changed? The, the easiest one would be starting to use AI. And yeah. uh, fairly obvious that, uh, you know, if you want to use AI, just try a bit and, and just... I suppose progressed. The plan was to use it as much, get as many cows to AI as possible, and um, ended up, you know, the bull was here. He made a bull two or three cows. So at that stage, it was time to to get rid of him and, and just run with AI. Um, a lot more flexibility there in in what can be selected. Different bulls to different cows. You know, I could use ten bulls any year. Um, Great flexibility there, especially when you're trying to breed replacements. Um, and we would now, you know, with AI bred cows coming into the system, that there is a good improvement in the quality of stock. You, you mentioned there that you're autumn calving and spring calving. So for autumn calving, for me, that's quite easy in terms of AI and there's no issue there. But but for spring calving, uh, how did you manage AI around those spring calves? Because they're, they're outside uh, when they're being AI to take it. So how, how did you manage that? Well, we would have a bit of grazing area around the house here, and uh, particularly that period from middle of May to the end of June, um, we try and concentrate the spring cows around that area. Uh, after that, you know, you could reduce numbers. You maybe the first three weeks is the most intense, and you know we would have peak grass growth. So even we were limited a wee bit on the grazing area, you get through that three weeks or so get a lot of them AI'd and the, and the pressure would come off a wee bit um, then maybe you know like middle of the summer we do a quick scan of the early ones and them's confirmed in calves we can shift them on a bit of ground across the road you know and uh, at that stage even the do loss it they're probably too late to, to come back in again anyway so okay yeah that's that's basically how we managed 
any any tips? As well, you've moved from 100% stock bulls to to 100% AI. Any tips for for fellas out there that maybe in terms of heat detection or or AI timing or anything like that? Like, what have you found that worked or what didn't work, or did you have to put in extra fences or infrastructure to try and make sure that you get in them cows handy? Or or is there any tips there for them? I will. I definitely say you no. Know, like we didn't necessarily put in extra fences, but we were doing that to set up the paddocks. Okay. And a major advantage, if you want AA cows, is to have cows well used to elected fencers. Because I can divide a cow out, even you have to take a couple with her, out of a paddock without taking the whole lot of them in handy enough. They're well used to the fencers. And we would have a main fencer, a main fencer around the, that wee bit of block around the home farm there. Um, definitely. Also, I find, you know, paddocks, rotational grazing, the cows are used to being handled regularly and moved regularly and that all you know adds to the system that they're used to being taken in and, and uh, they don't be as unsettled when you go to do that. Uh, do you do yeah. you use a, a vasectomized bull at all? And no. no, you don't you don't need to you don't find the need to use that. Um and and, and over the years um we, we we just manual heat detection um Best results we would get early morning, late, you know, just before dark then as well. Um, now we we currently put in a, a heat detection system, but it's more I see it as as labour point of view. Okay. Um, so it worked well with autumn cows, and um, we're going to be fit to use that now with the spring cows with grass. So it'll be good to keep an eye on that. Taking a look at your figures, uh, Oliver, you, you, you've had phenomenal performance in terms of, you know, to 2013, you've moved from 412 of a gross margin to the hectare. I know 2020 probably is <clears throat> a little bit different in that you've, you've changed around ground in that. But even if we go back to 2019, you're up at 963, which is which is really super performance. And it's a big, big turnaround for the farm. In terms of where you're going from here onwards, I guess you, you've done six or eight years in the programme. Where to for, for Oliver McKenna and his farm? <laughs> For the next maybe five years, or have you thought about that, or or where the farm is going, or what what else do you need to do uh, on the farm for the next couple of years? Well, um, that land that we got in twenty thirteen, we've lost it now, and uh, like there's it's very difficult to rent land in this area. There's a serious demand on land, and, and like uh, certainly if you could get a bit of land, I would take it. But uh, there's serious competition there, and the plan is. Till a reduce back to about 50 cows, try and keep 50 cows on, on what we own. And we're starting a, a dairy cow rearing enterprise where I'll be contract rearing dairy cows. So, the reason for going that route is it access to land? You need access to land to, to, to keep cow numbers up, but you don't need access to, to, to big land, we'll say, for, for, for your dairy calf rearing enterprise. That's the, that's the main reason, yeah. And it, just tell us a little bit about that. You take in the calves at what age and you bring them to what age? They're to come to me at three weeks and I have to keep them for 12 weeks. And uh, then out, they, they uh, distribute them to all our producers that's bringing them then through to beef. And I just start again with the next batch. And you don't really have a gamble in that in terms of it's a steady income. You know what you're going to get, we'll say, regardless of calf price or, or input prices, you have a fairly steady income there. Yeah. Cut your targets, I think. Just take it yes. from there. Okay, um, just to go back to maternal breeding, Oliver, there's, there's maybe a thought out there, and I, I'd like to get your view on it. You've, you've went maternal breeding for the last number of years, and some people think that, you know, there's a big negative to that, that, that maternal bulls won't deliver carcass weight, they won't deliver, you know, good carcass quality, and um, they won't deliver good calves. What's your own thoughts on that? Like, is, is there bulls out there that will do the two jobs in terms of ticking both boxes? There is I um now some of the some of the bulls I would be using the calves wouldn't be ideally suited to the store market or the wingland trade or that but I would find when I finish them as young bulls there's no there's no real pain penalty there the same no like pay a bit of attention to the bulls you're using you want maternal bulls but don't neglect the carcass traits, you know, you want a suckler cow, you're trying to breed a beef animal at the end of the day, she needs good positive carcass weight figures and confirmation and that as well, so we pay a bit of attention to that as well, 
um, try and use bulls with good reliability. And uh, like we would be finding sometimes the fancy boy that was going to sell well in the Winland ring mightn't even be the best performer out of a batch of bulls, you know. So, um, <clears throat> like I suppose this past three years, we would be consistently hitting around 385 kilos dead weight, all using ours on. Uh, Going forward, uh, target wouldn't be really to increase carcass weight. You know, we would have some hitting 400 slightly above it, but 400 is sort of the target. We don't want them too heavy. What I'd be aiming to do, take a month off it. You know, we we would have we would have reduced the kill needs this year. Um, you know, they, from we started finishing bulls, they're a lot less than hitting up on the 16 months. Okay. You know, and what's the secret to that, Oliver? What's what's your secret? Is it is it a milky cow and taking a good heavy calf off the cow at the back end of the year, or is it getting your management right from that point forward? Or what's what's the secret to hitting that <laughs> big calf as weight? I think it's from he hits the ground till he hits okay. the billboard <laughs> of the lorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I get him a good start and keep him going. Um, the, the them bulls, you know, there's no there's no store paid, there's no holding them back. We would we would have grazed autumn bulls at times, but like we would be giving them the best of it. Uh, autumn born bulls weaned around April time, grazed maybe till mid July, the start of August. A uh, there is a wee window there for a bit of cheap gain, but a uh, we'd be targeting a kilo and a half at grass. We would try and have uh, maybe a few. In calf cows cleaning out paddocks or something, I wouldn't even maybe force them bulls to clean the paddocks out tight. Um, and apart from that, you know, like the spring bulls, uh, come September, we'd be starting them on a bit of creek feed and uh, just try and keep them moving. Good quality silage, save you a bit of money on the feeding there. Um, okay. the better, better it is, the better. Um, I tend to feed them on silage if I can at all and, and just gradually gradually increase the feed the feeding as I go along. Okay, Oliver, uh, thanks very much for that. That's a great overview of your farming system. And look at you and, and the rest of the participants in the programme deserve a lot of credit because I know it's not easy maybe putting it out there every week or every couple of weeks, what's going on on the farm. It's all right talking when it's going well, but we all know it, it, it sometimes doesn't go well and, and we, we, we write about that. And, and look, at you deserve great credit for, for being in the public eye for that. So thanks very much for joining us this evening. And uh, I'm sure you'll join us for a few questions at the end of the night. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you. Okay, folks, I'm delighted now to be joined by Alistair McNeely, uh, Muckamore, County Antrim. Uh, Alistair, uh, delighted you can join us uh, tonight. I guess uh, just to have a, ch a bit of a chat about, uh, I suppose, your farm and farming system, first of all. So tell us a little bit about where you're farming um, and what your farming system is. Hi, Adam. Yes, as, as you say, uh, Muckamore, uh, County Antrim, which is just up beside Greenmount Abbey Farm. I'm sure most, most folk know where that is. Um, I'm farming about 145 acres, a uh, mixture of, of uh, rented and owned ground. Uh, it's all in grass. Um, running uh, in and around that 90 uh, cows with calves uh, during the grazing season. So calving down uh, 100, uh, well, 105 to calve down this year. <clears throat> all spring, spring calving, so starting from mid-March onwards. Um, for that 10, 12 week, week period. Uh, and I'm operating a, a, a steer and, and heifer system. So uh, trying to finish the steers at that 19, 20 months of age and the heifers then keep a batch of them for uh, replacements for myself to calve down at two years of age. And then whatever is not, not needed for breeding then is, is uh, finished. Um, bull wise, I'd, I'd be running a, a limousine stock bull, two Angus stock bulls and then uh, over the past few years, I've, I've used a, a mixture of uh, AI. So a bit of short corn, a bit of Semitol, and, and this, this past year tried, tried a bit of Charlie uh, as well. Uh, so as, as well as the cattle, I have two uh, broiler houses uh, contracted to Moy Park. And uh, it's just, just myself working on the farm, so just, just one labour unit. 
So we, I'll just looking at your figures here. You've came from 66 cows in 2016. I think average cow numbers up to you've just mentioned 105 uh, in 2021. So I suppose you know that that's a big big step. And, and I see here you're still the same ground from from 2016 to 2020. So I, I could ask you what were you doing in 2016, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you what what sort of changes maybe you know you had to implement. I suppose to to, to lift cow numbers uh, up to that up to that level. Yeah, well, so, some of the biggest changes that, that, that uh, we put in place on the farm is, is uh, increasing the stocking rate. So carrying more stock on uh, what ground I had. Uh, so trying to get more out of, out of what I had. So that it was a, a matter of uh, setting up paddocks, although I, I did operate a, a bit of a paddock system, but not to the extent that I'm, I'm operating that now. So, um, so yeah, more, more paddocks, um, measuring grass growth, weekly and, and, and putting that into Agrinet and using that, that data from, from the software package there to uh, predict what, what grass is ahead of me and what growth there is and, and to you know better manage the, the, the grassland that's there. Um, so yeah, that, that, that stock rate was pushed really by better grassland management. Fertilizer wise hasn't really changed that much. Um, 2017, I was using about 28 ton of fertilizer uh, 2020, um, it was just marginally higher, about 20, 29.8 ton of fertilizer. So the most of that has been carried on on uh, split, splitting fields up into, into paddocks. Um, yeah, so st stock and rate has went from 1.85 in 16 to uh, 2.6 livestock units a hectare in 2020. Um, so I, I don't know whether that will go any further or not. It's, it's, Yes. In terms of grassland management, I always grapple with this in terms of uh, it, it's a hard sell to dry stock farmers and, and you're, you're, you're obviously able to grow a lot of grass there. You're, you're hitting over 10 tonne of hectare, dry matter to the hectare. But why do you think it's such a hard sell? Because if, if we look at dairy farmers, they're, they're good at grassland management or measuring grass weekly. And it's almost uh, on the beef side, we need to be nearly better than them because margins are so, so tight on the beef side of the house. But, but yet uh, we've, a, we've a low number of, of dry stock farmers measuring grass your experience of that and in terms of measuring grass you know has it been of value to you and why do you think a lot of more farmers aren't measuring grass um on a weekly basis yeah i would say a lot of people are are, are staying back from the paddock system because maybe predominantly part-time farmers uh were working at the suck cows and the beef beef system and, and uh, up until 2016 i did work off farm um so it's a major change for me in 2016 coming home to farm full time, and that's why I wanted to put more more effort and more more time into, into the cattle. Um, so I'd say time is a big restraint for, for a lot of farmers. But you know, once once you get into it and get uh, the system set up, um, it, it, you know, it's not it's not too hard to manage once you have your fences and gates and, and uh, drinkers all in place. Um, for me, that you know, that wasn't done all in one year. It was it was kind of work in progress over a number of years, and, and there's still things I would like to do to pro progress that further. So, um, yeah, I would say time time's a big limiting factor for most folks there. I want to hone in a little bit on breeding uh, with you, Alistair, in terms of I suppose there's two things maybe that pops out of me. Um, well, there's actually three things. One of them has been you, you opted to breed your own replacements rather than purchase them in. Uh, why why did you make that decision, or why was that decision made as, as on the farm? I suppose it came down to cost. Uh, when we looked at the figures when I joined the program at the start, uh, you know those heifers that I was buying in were were uh, costing me a fair bit of money, and if, if they turned out not the calf, then you know I was fattening them and and, and maybe taking a, a bit of a hit on them at that stage. So the decision was made to move across to breeding your own own replacements, and, and the beauty of that is then you know you, you can select out of your own a group of group of heifers, and if some of them don't turn out in calf, well you just you know uh, pop them over into the finishing uh, pen, and uh, you know it's not you're not losing the same same money on them. And in terms of coming in there with the short horn, I guess that's maybe an unusual one, maybe not not the not the you know. The country's most popular breed, but it is making you know maybe a bit of a comeback there in some herds. But why why choose short horn? Are you looking to reduce cow size, or is it just to get in more maternal traits, or ease of finishing, or, or what was it? Yeah, it was just to get in in a few more maternal traits, try and put a bit more milk into the cows. As I say, they were predominantly black limousine cows, um, so a, a bit more milk wouldn't go amiss um, in that respect. 
and then the final thing on breeding is, I guess, synchronization. Um, you've you've went down that road. Tell us a little bit about how you found it in terms of conception rates and also costs. So, so I think you, you said you've looked at costs, uh, you know, per cow maybe and per calf. So what do you think? Will it be something you'll do in the future, or are you happy with it? Yeah, well, my first year of synchronizing seemed to seem to go well. Um, a couple of years prior to that, uh, I just AI the cows on uh, detecting natural heats. Uh, and with, with smaller numbers, but uh, I wanted to try the synchronizing this past year. So I synchronized 40 cows, uh, 21 week and, and 20 uh, a second week. Um, and I got a fairly good hit with them. I was happy enough with it. Um, the first batch did 62% uh, to first service. That was the uh, Shorthorn uh, Bull from AI Services, Hussar. And the second week, then they did 74% to first service, and they were um, mostly red limb cows to I put them to the a Charlie, uh, Charlie sire from AI services, uh, Stolichid Narcos. Um, so was, there any, was, 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 was there any difference between the two groups, Alistair, in terms of the, the, the increased conception rate with the second group? Were they in better condition? Were they longer calved? Was, was there any differences? Uh, yeah, the, 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 the only difference there was uh, the second batch I gave them a Jagger Receptal the night before uh, we, we did the fixed time AI. Um, that, that was suggested to me by the AI man, so it definitely settled the cows. The, the, the batch the week before, uh, some of them were showing the heat the night before. Uh, so we AI'd a couple of them in the morning uh, of the fixed time date. And then that evening, there was uh, four of them still showing signs of heat. Uh, and we AI'd them a second time the, the following morning. So he suggested then for the following week to, to try the receptal the night before. Uh, so I gave them a jig at uh, 9, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, and that definitely seemed to, seemed to settle them. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, it seemed to make a difference. Uh, moving on, Alistair, I guess, to, to look back across the last, you know, four or five years in the programme, um, tell me, I suppose, there are two things I want to know. The, the easiest change you've made, I, I guess, uh, farmers listen to programme advisors and they listen to the, to the team around them as regards what they need to do and what they need to do in the next few years. But, but what, what has been the easiest thing or the sort of thing you said, geez, I should have been at this. Why was I not at this before, before now? Um, what, what has been the easiest change you made? It was probably short, shortening the calvin spread, so you know it was fairly easy to do. Just have a have a fixed date for taking the bull out, uh, or, or stop AI in, and um, that, that's that's uh, you know an end date to the calvin. Um, or sometimes what I, I did, you know, it's not always easy finding somewhere to, to go with a bull, so I would have let him run with the cows, you know, for the rest of the season. But then come scaling time, had a had a fixed date for uh, for cutting off the air and anything after that was called. So. Yeah, having that having that date to cut off, you know, and culling those cows, and and the more cows you culled each year, you find it tightened up the, the calving spread the following year. You know, it tightened up the breeding period, um, and having those cows, you know, uh, hitting the ground or uh, at breeding time with the right body condition. Uh, so you know, having them with good good plain and nutrition. Um, this last year. Uh, I gave the cows mineral blocks during the breeding seasons, which, which, which seemed to help things as well. So, okay, and then I suppose on the other end of things, the hardest thing uh, that you know, the hardest change you've made uh, over the last four or five years, the thing you found really tough in terms of change, and um, what has that been? Yeah, something that probably takes you know took the most effort was shortening that finishing period for for the bullocks. Um, you know, for a lot of a lot of their gain was to depend on how they did that second season at, at, at grass. And sometimes I found, um, you know, they performed well in the first half of the grazing season, the second half um, performance tailed off a bit. That was, you know, probably down to a combination of factors, you know, well, weather conditions and the grass going out through them too quickly. Uh, but also here, I, I would have a, a mineral deficiency as well. So be low on selenium and, and iodine. So that's something I have to uh, keep on top of, but, um, it was a matter of getting those uh, steers out, out to grass early in the season, try and get as much gain on them as, as possible. And, and now I'll be bringing them in earlier in the autumn time rather than trying to uh, keep them out of grass for longer, thinking you were saving money. Uh, actually, you know, I, was, I started to bring them in um, early September time, and put them on uh, good silage that has been made off uh, the, the, the grazing platform, off, off the paddocks. 
um, and you know a, a short intensive finishing period and I'm managing to get, get them away now uh, a good proportion of them in uh, November December and on into January time which um, has shaved about 38 days off the, the, the average finishing period and in 2016 it was 682 days uh, to finish and 2020 it was 644 days so you know, it's a fair saving on, on me so over it, a, a it, batch it, of 40 or 50, 50 bullocks. It's a short, sharp finish. Some of, some of your colleagues or some of, you, some of the rest of the programme farmers went down that bull beef route. Is there a reason why you didn't go down that route on, on your farm or, or uh, did, you, did you look at it? Um, well, we kind of did look at, at it at the start, but I, I, you know, I have the ground here for grazing those, those steers. If I went down the bull beef route, I would have to be replacing them with grass with, with uh, more cows. Uh, to make sure I was, you know, utilising uh, the, the ground to the, the best of its ability. Uh, so for me, you know, calving down 100 cows uh, is enough without adding more to that. Um, and the way the, the ground lies here, um, rent ground of, of two, ba two blocks of ground away from home rented, uh, and, and those two blocks of ground just suit uh, the steers in one place and the heifers in another place. Uh, and just checking them every other day, whereas, you know, if I, if I was putting a batch of cows and calves on them, uh, you know, it would take a bit more management to look after them away from home. So, you know, a combination of factors. OK, final question, I guess, uh, going forward the next five years, what does it mean for the McNeely farm? Um, will it be another poultry shed or will it be another more suckler cows? What, what's, what's the thoughts on, on where you're going from here? Uh, probably st stocking rate is, is near its limit. Um, it has increased well over, over the years, but uh, limit in fact will, will be housing. Uh, so I might have to look at that uh, in the near future if I was going to increase numbers uh, anymore. Uh, so probably concentrating more on, on what, what I have there, maybe a bit more genetic improvement, trying to get more milk into the, into the cows or try and get a bit more carcass gain on, on those uh, in those bullocks um, and maybe now that I have increased numbers um, and, and got to where I want to be uh, you know I, I may have some surplus breeding stock that I could sell so that's maybe something to, to look at uh, go, going forward um, and maybe, maybe bringing the cabin forward a, a couple of weeks just to tighten things up a bit, a bit more there. Okay, Alistair, uh, thanks very much. Um, look, you deserve great credit from where the farm has come from over the last five years. And, and as I said to the other guys that I spoke to, to do that in full public eye and full public view and make mistakes uh, in front of people and, and have it wrote about in the paper, it's not easy. And you, you all deserve a huge amount of credit uh, for that. So thanks very much for joining us this evening. And I'm sure you'll join us for a few questions at the end. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Okay, folks, great to get that overview on uh, the farming systems um, and some of your viewpoints as well and the changes made on your farms um, over the last number of years. We're going to start now our question and answer session, and I'm going to start with Barry Carty uh, in Fermanagh. Uh, Barry, I guess you talked to us about keeping weanlands longer, um, we'll say growing them into a heavier weight. Uh, and a, there's a question in here, I guess by holding weanlands to around 12 months <clears throat> and tighter calving, is your housing under more pressure? Uh, so, so a very valid question best answer it is it is under pressure but uh, with the start of the program there I, I built a new shed there a new 5A shed and there's nearly 40 cows in it and cows with autumn herd so um, it's, uh, I didn't think it was falling very but it, it is under pressure but I'm managing the way I am at, uh, at the minute so fingers crossed that, that it'll, it'll be that, okay in the future. That shed is there any anything special about that shed in terms of autumn calving is there a creep at the back of it or, or did you do anything special in terms of that shed for, for housing autumn calvers? I just look, it's, it's very it's, it's a bit higher than normal shed and it's well ventilated and it has a, a, a canopy on the top and then I have separating the cows up stock board and I just get them sucked twice a day and the, the calves layered in a creep on their own they're getting silage and me so they're they're going on okay and once get in twice a day to suck so it it, it brings them the heat uh, detection on a bit easier. Second question was for you as well, Barry. Um, would you consider calving all your cows in August September? Uh, or is that practical for, for your farm? It's not Adam, to be honest there. I had 40 there calved um, there last year. And the last few years, the July and, or August especially, has been very wet. And they ended up having the house and a few of the house. And then you end up having a scouring that. So, you know, it's very hard grass for that amount 
pretty current and uh, reasonable weather. So, uh, no, I'll keep the split in 20 in the spring and it, it, it makes it easier for me to manage. Next question actually is a follow on from that. And, and, and it's does the split cabin between autumn and spring complicate things at grass, uh, more grazing groups, etc.? So, so does the fact that you have so many groups of grass, or does that actually suit your farm because you're quite, we'll say, fragmented in terms of a couple of different, we'll say, out farms? Does it suit it? It does. It, it suits it very well. Actually, it, it makes life easier because the autumn cows, their wean come March time and they're going to wait to rough heather hills for the summer, which need very little care. And then the 20 spring are easier to manage to keep have enough grass for 20 spring cows and calves and a few of the later later animals carried over from the autumn herd in graze and grass during the summer as well. So it, it works out pretty well for me. Just, it suits my farm. Okay, Barry, thanks for that. Oliver, I have a couple of questions in for you as well. Um, in terms of um, moving to, to more maternal genetics, you, you, you told us about that in terms of moving your farm towards maternal genetics. Are you, are you tempted with that bull system to move back to terminal genetics? Uh, and this is a question in as well. Like, wh why, wh why move, is, is there a negative to those maternal genetics or, or, or would you be tempted to go back to terminal? No, not necessarily, no. Um... Like I would find that if you use good quality bulls, even the bull calves are a, still going to perform well. Um, the only I would maybe use a term on the cow that I definitely don't want a replacement from, and then regardless if she's a heifer or a bull that will be beefed or sold. Do you, do, you, do you think is it the bulls that's doing that? Like, if if you were in a steer system, would you would you compensate as much with with those maternal genetics? Would you would you have a poor steer if you were running maternal bulls um, rather than terminal bulls? Or like, is the bull really compensating for using that maternal genetics? Um, I would say there's is, this is a small bit, uh, but at at the same time. You would still have good quality bullock. Um, we would have used, we, like I, I would have sold steers in the past, um, and and uh, they, would, they would still be good good animals. Um, if you take, it's it's continually improving the quality of the cow and the quality of the bull calves will come along with that too. Either. You're, you're, you're selling surplus heifers there, and, and we'll say it's something we're looking at on Tullamore Farm in terms of maybe sex semen um, to go all heifers um, on Tullamore Farm. Uh, that's for another day. But if did you compare your heifers, your surplus heifers that you're selling and your bulls that you're finishing as to what, what um, what's leaving more money when you have your cost taken out, or have you looked at that yet? No, not in detail, but um, the heifers would be definitely lower input. Quite possibly would leave more, but a uh, you know the bull the bull's a lot faster when the heifer's ready for bone, the bull's in cash like. Yes, yes, I have you. You know, so he, he does help the cash flow. Yeah, you've you've cash coming in at different times of the year. Alistair, I'll move on to you. Um, You've moved to 24 month cabin, cabin homebred heifers um, from buying in. W would you go back to buying in your replacements in the future, or are you happy with, with your homebred replacements? Uh, no, I'm quite happy with, with breeding the, the homebred uh, replacements. Um, I'm kind of needing 20, 25 head each year now uh, coming along, so you know, it would maybe be harder to source. Um, I suppose from a disease point of view, it's better having breeding your own and keeping a, a closed herd. But you know, it's nice nice seeing your own heifers coming along and, and developing into cows and seeing how they do. So no, I don't I don't think I'll go back. You're also killing animals younger. Another question in here will say, would it pay you to feed steers on to this question is on to twenty four months and increase your carcass weight on those we'll say bullocks to, to bring them through to twenty four months or even even more maybe um you're 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 killing them maybe younger than that. What what do you, what what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I suppose from the from the start of the scheme, uh carcass weights have dropped uh from what three sixty to three forty five, I think it was. That's Probably more a reflection of the, the number of Angus steers that, that I'm finishing now, so you know they will have a, a lower carcass weight, and you have to be careful, uh, you know, not to be keeping them too long to be pushing them over their, their fat class. 
Um, but the other, you know, it's, it's good getting rid of them at that earlier age as well because they haven't the housing space to take them to 24 months now. Um, need to get rid of them to get uh, the weanlings off the straw bed of houses to, to get them ready for, for Calvin. Um, so no, I, I wouldn't have the housing first and foremost to win them any longer. Okay, Francis, um, I have a couple of questions in here for you as well, and, and Daryl, um, and look, I'll start with you. Um, you've moved a lot of the programme participants to Bull Beef um, over the years, we'll say, a lot of them, and even this year's, we'll say this year's cohort, or, or the last couple of years' cohort, a lot of them have moved to Bull Beef. G given the factory sentiment uh, towards Bull Beef, was that, was that the correct decision um, for for the program farmers, or or why why go down the bull beef route uh, with a lot of them? I suppose Adam, at the at the start of the program, we, we sat down and we we really done a a, a benchmark on each farm, and we looked at what the resources were, and um, I suppose what what the desire was for each farm too. And when you sit down in, in Perry. Um, the bull beef systems definitely stacks up the best, particularly on your lowland farms, where you can maximise the output of of um, of cow. Um, yes, there's a risk with the bull beef system. Uh, there's a risk of meal prices going up, but we we're confident in those farms that went down the bull beef system that we were making high enough quality silage. We could do it at a low cost. And I mean, I think all of the farmers here had the conversation with the with the processor to see was there a desire to take the bull beef. And I suppose in the bull beef system that we've done, um, they've all been under 16 months. They've been in spec. So maybe there was a risk for the farmers that went into it. Um, but but just when you do the mads on it, uh, the under 16 month bull beef system here is, is definitely making the most money. And I suppose to follow on from that, there's another question in here, maybe and it's, it's a sort of an add on to that, Francis. Um, we'll say if stock and race. You've, you've shown that it was stock and rate is a key driver, right, to, to, to output and to farm output and, and to increase in gross margin on the farms. What, what about part-time farmers, we'll say, there's a huge cohort of those out there that maybe don't want to drive uh, stock and rate on their farms because they're working and, and obviously they have other commitments or whatever, and, and they don't want to, we'll say, go to that 2.5 or whatever license units to the hectare. What, what, what's the option for those uh, in terms of... Um, you know, driving driving output maybe on, on a on a lower stock farm. Is there is there a way of doing that without without filling the place with stock? Yeah, and, and I suppose Adam, that's, that's one thing that we did mention earlier. I suppose from in terms of land type, there's there's also out there, and I think if you ask the farmers around this screen, you know that 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 have really pushed the stock and rate. There's maybe work in terms of that grassland management too. I mean, a lot of part-time farmers out there maybe just don't have don't have the time to put the effort into that. I suppose what we we'll are saying to those farmers, you know, you really have to concentrate on a system that's going to get you right from from you. If you're going to do that, you need your calving index. You need to be calving down at two years of age, and you need a healthy. Um, I suppose concentrating on the cow, making sure that you have a cow that's actually, as I say, getting calf every year and produce a high quality calf. And that's where I suppose you see a lot of these part-time farmers going actually down in that route. They must make sure that they get the output. Like that, that's, I suppose, what about, the, this was another question in uh, from Alan. Uh, wh what about the Weanland man? Have you forgot about him? Everybody finishing, are you saying the Weanland system is bunched? Um, because you've moved everybody to a finishing system or whatever. I know, I know Barry is, 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 is selling Weanlands, but what about that Weanland man? I, like you've, you've obviously said a couple of them there. I'm not going to ask you to repeat it, but it's, it's about doing those simple things right, I take it, in any farm system, regardless of what you're at. Definitely, Adam. I think Barry has shown that, that um, there is a return in the Weanland system. And it's, sometimes we look at the Weanland system, we think you know there's less money in that, but... That's very often because most of the Wayland producers are situated in the poor areas. Most boys that are producing sitting in areas where maybe, you know, the um, lower in terms of the stocking rate. I would say if you brought Barry's system and you put it on Alistair's farm and carried the stocking rate that Alistair's carrying, you would probably generate a similar gross margin. You'd probably generate a similar profit, but Alistair would have to carry a lot more cows and maybe just doesn't have the will to do that. So we'd say is, there's not actually an awful lot of difference in terms of the Weanland system or maybe the bull beef system. It's just the stocking rate that most of those Weanland men 
in, in terms of where, where they're carrying the stock. It tends to be on the poor quality land. Uh, Francis, biggest change that, that a farmer watching tonight can make to their farm? You, you've been running a lot of farms. You have a huge amount of experience. What, what do you say in, in terms of the, the, the biggest change that a farmer can, can, the biggest win, I guess, the easiest win that he can or she can, can implement on the farm? Yes, Adam, and I suppose we've we've talked about a lot of these things earlier, you know, there's real easy wins and low cost in terms of grass, in terms of getting the cow as efficient as possible, in terms of maybe retaining your own heifers, using AI, you know, getting as high quality of stock as possible. But one of the things I'd see from all the people around this screen and probably all the farmers that we've worked with that's been successful is that they've implemented a system on, on their farm. They know exactly when they want or when they should be calving to make the most amount of money. They know when they should be finishing cattle, they know what weight they need to be finishing them to, they know how much silage they need to make, and they don't tend to chop and change. I suppose the other thing is all of those farmers have been receptive to taking advice. I suppose any farmer that's starting out at the moment, um, rather than maybe looking across the hedge or going to the mark maybe to see what other farmers are doing, CAFRA have a number of, of knowledge transfer and um, innovation schemes, you know, the likes of our business development groups, our technology demonstration farms or farm innovation visits where you can go and see what other farms are doing maybe learn from the mistakes that that they've seen and also what technologies are working out there on farms what's tried and tested so i suppose make sure you get a system in place work with an advisor get a development plan get your farm benchmarked and set targets of where you want to go and then use the resources that's out there, because I suppose that's what the farmers in this program have done, they've ultimately used the resources that we have given them. I guess, yeah, uh, the, the original, there's two questions in this, but I'll ask you the first part of it first. The original farms that you would have started working with m many years ago, um, have they sustained the high output and the high profitability that they would have started out on? Like, have, have, the, have they stayed the course more or less uh, on the system that, that, that you would have put them on? Yeah, I would say, and I think I showed that in the phase one farms, a lot of the farms continued to develop even after we had worked with them. And as you know, you know, sucklers and in terms of breeding, it's a slow burner. You're, not, you're maybe not going to get all the results in two or three years. It could be five or six years before you see the full results of that. And I suppose one of the other things that's been, that's been sustained in this program, some people have took a critical look at their business. They've maybe saw how far can I take it in the sucklers? They brought in some dairy calf to beef, maybe half a rear. And, and some people have taken the plunge then and went across to uh, dairy. And, and I mean, I maybe wouldn't look at that as a negative, uh, you know, because again, I said they've took a critical look at their business. They said, how can I make the most out of the resource that I have here? Got a good standard of grassland management here. What, what can I do to take that the next step? So I'd say, yeah, the majority of farmers have taken the course, but some farmers have also taken a different course and maybe went on to maybe went on to and maybe went on to another enterprise it's funny francis that's that's one of the questions that actually came in tonight was was are there would say many of the program farmers gone dairy and i think if i was to look back at the at the 2009 cohort of better farmers in in the south um a lot of them are dairy now and i wouldn't see that as a negative at all i think if you can if you can bring farmers to that point and give them the confidence to take as you said the plunge to the next step that's the next level and it's the most natural place for them to go and i think it's a great testament to the program if you have done put in the groundwork for, to make people um you know have the confidence to make that decision um finally Final question, Francis. I guess it came in here. Is, is it is it worthwhile? And maybe it's it's very apt this year in terms of the store prices that we're seeing uh, in March. Um, is it worth? We'll say suckler to beef systems. We'll say finishing the animals, taking them the whole way. Or we better offload them at the store stage and, and let that specialised finisher, you know, probably able to buy straights a lot cheaper. Probably able to get a better beef price if they're putting through numbers at the end of it. Um, is there? Is there merit in that, do you think, um, or is it, you know, Robin Peter to pay Paul and it'll win one year and it won't win the next, or what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, Adam, I've no doubt there's individual years where you maybe look back and you say, I should have sold that animal at 18 months instead of keeping it the 20 months, or I should have sold it as a weanling. But I suppose, ultimately, the farmers that we've taken this program, you know, their system was very much based on a development plan. Um, you look at that development plan, we're looking at, well, how much silage have we to make? Um, what's the resources in terms of housing that we have to use? And sometimes when you chop and change, you know, you maybe one year you'll maybe yield out of it and other years you won't. And sometimes by taking that animal away earlier, you have to make sure, well, well really what you're doing is you're costing your silage then into it. 
But if you've got silage left over, you know, you're not converting that silage in, into money. It's important to look at, you know, right, I'm taking this because it doesn't pay to keep it. But are you going to sell the silage for the 30 pound a ton that you valued at? And if you have not, well, then really what you're doing by keeping the animal on is converting that silage into money. I suppose what we try to say to farmers is don't chop and change. Try to get into a, a system, get as efficient as possible at it. And ultimately, you don't have a lot of control of beef price then after that. Um, and I suppose the farmers have really bought into that. And I suppose some farmers have been tempted then to go down the route of maybe finishing a little bit earlier, taking some out to the mart. But in general, most people have stuck to the finishing system. The only add on to that, it says, some farmers have said, listen, here, I'm doing this as efficient as, as possible. Is there an option to take maybe surplus heifers to the mart? There's people out there. I've went down a route of AA breeding. Maybe there's another market for the heifers here that I'm selling, maybe in, instead of taking them through to the factory. I think that's where the added value is coming from. I think for a lot of farmers, there's an opportunity out there to get added value, added value out of that too. Finally, Francis, uh, the future of the suckler cow in Northern Ireland. I know that's a really, we'll say, wide-ranging question, and we could be here all night maybe discussing it, but where do you think the suckler cow is going, and has she a, a bright future in Northern Ireland? Yeah, well, I suppose... To look forward, sometimes you have to look back at them. And, you know, the average herd size in Northern Ireland for suckler cows has been about 18 cows for quite a number of years now and hasn't really changed an awful lot. So, so I suppose you have to say is there's a large cohort of farmers there that maybe are not pushing. It's not their sole income. It's part of a bigger picture, you know, what they have. Maybe they've got a part-time job. And the other thing in Northern Ireland is, is, is that a lot of farms are fragmented. There maybe isn't an awful lot of other things that they can do. Some people have looked at the at the at the dairy calf to, the beef system. When we go through that, there's years that's better than the sucklers, and you know, there's some years that the sucklers are better. I suppose what we say in that is, you know, if you're not good at sucklers, you know, you're unlikely to be good at the dairy calf to the beef. Uh, so it says, you know, if yeah. you're doing really well at your suckler system, maybe look at something else. But I would say if you're not doing a really efficient job at your suckler system. It's unlikely that you know you're going to achieve that out of out of out of uh, another system. Um, in terms of the future of, of the suckler cow, you know we have this attitude, you know, and sometimes we do benchmark and we say, you know, there's very little profit, but not everyone is driven completely by profit. Some people are building a balance sheet. Some people want a profit because they want to take money out of it this year. I mean, and other people maybe want to take cash out of the business. But we can't maybe just look at profit. There's more to sucklers than just getting a profit every year. There's a way to think that, especially when we've got a lot of part-time farmers out there. <clears throat> Daryl, I'm going to move on to you. Um, the first change that you see, you, you've, you've been in a, on all these farms from the very beginning. What's, and maybe I'll ask Francis the same question, but what's the biggest win that you can see on, on any beef farm in Northern Ireland? So, so you were working with these programme farmers and, and you made changes on them. What's the biggest win that anybody watching tonight can make to their farm the very first thing that everybody should do the, the first thing i'd say adam is probably sit down and actually make a plan for the farm um a lot of farmers can get into the habit of doing the same thing year in year out um and not have an end goal so if you don't have an end goal um what how, how do you how are you going to know where where to get to as such uh, or how to get to there I suppose if you ask me one quick win um, in terms of practical stuff that can be done on farm, it's probably getting soil tests done across the farm um, and finding out what your what your pH status is and correcting that first of all. Because um, whether you're going to drive stocking rate or not, um, you're going to improve your current situation in terms of the fertilizer you're putting on. So th that would be the two points for me um, anyway. Did all the program farmers have to take corrective action, Darrell, in relation to soil tests taken at the beginning of the program? Or what, what was the biggest thing they had to do just when you do mention soil tests? Was it lime or was it pea? Was it K? Or, or what, what, did, what, what was the most popular thing they had to do? Well, I suppose maybe Francis was in from, from the very start with us, tranche of farmers. But uh, I'd imagine, Adam, it wasn't, there's going to be no two farms the same. Um, some farms, Maybe the likes of Oliver and Declan that were in the pr program or previous tranche had a lot of that corrected. Um, maybe not all of it, but every farm has a different starting point. Um, and it's a bit like 
uh, Satnav needs to know where you're starting at to get to where to where you want to go. So that's yeah, the first point yeah. is to find out what the farm is like, and every farm is going to be different and have different amounts of work to do to to correct that. You made a few comments about weaning percentage um, and and heavy cows. Are you saying we'll say the day of the heavy cow is over that Semental or Charlie cow heading for eight hundred kilos is, is 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 she finished? Do I do I have to hang them up? No, I wouldn't worry too much about breed at all, Adam. Really, um, you know, you're you're you mentioned a few breeds there. Um, Barry Oliver Alistair probably has all those breeds, um, you know, but they're not keeping cows that are eight hundred kilos at the same time. Um, look, the the links have been shown between live weight and and maintenance feed requirements, and that's why we look at a weaning percentage. In theory, the bigger cow is going to need uh, a bigger nutritional requirement so she has to wean a bigger calf and there's cows that can do it adam but that's why we look at a percentage basis um we average cow weight across the the program farms would probably be sitting in around just under 650 kilos there this year that's everything that's weaned the weaned the calf um and that's you know when that's the average there is cows into those bigger weights but we're looking at that there sort of average and that's probably you're still going to find it you know adam if you take really good weaning performance of of 1.2 and 1.4 for males or heifers and males still difficult to wean a 50 percent off a 650 kilo cow um it's a very hard target but if it's you know if a target's easy and you're hitting it every year it's not really a target it's a standard so um absolutely um, I'm going to move on to Alistair. I know um, we'll say synchronization costs. I think maybe I asked you, Alistair during the video piece uh, about the synchronization costs, and I think you looked at it maybe across both ways. Was it maybe per cow and per calf, or what? 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 In terms of working out that, um, what? What are you looking at? Uh, over the forty cows, it was working into about fifteen hundred and twelve pound, uh, which was about thirty-seven eighty ahead. Uh, so that was over the 40 cows that were synchronized, but if you split that over then what actually held, uh, there was 29 of them held to service, um, it works out with 53 or 54 pound head. Um, obviously if you had a, a poor conception rate then uh, that, that cost would go up per head. Is that cost including the cost of the AI straw or are you, are you putting that in that you're going to have that cost anyway regardless whether you synchronize or not? No, that, that's including the AI straw. Uh, so the drugs and, and AI on, on a, includes a, a pre-breeding scan as well. I scanned it before, before we went into the program too. Okay, thanks, Alistair. Um, I'm coming close now to the end. Just a few questions left. Um, Oliver, uh, one in on WhatsApp uh, for you. Um, what is more, which is more profitable, autumn or spring calving on your farm? Good question. Um, I suppose the way the way the system's set up, the the two work together. On uh, paper, you could sit down and work out on uh, uh, a spring cow might be more profitable, but with the bull beef system, uh, there'd, there'd be very little in it because, especially if I was getting autumn bulls out the grass for that spell from you know april till end of july mid july they would compete fairly well uh i suppose the disadvantages you need good quality silage you probably have to feed them a bit of meal and you have they probably take a wee bit more management than spring cows but the my system is working the two together and uh carrying the stocking rate about 60 spring cows and work the two together as for the run about the stocking rate and the autumn cows add a bit of flexibility there as well. Okay, so it's not it, it, it has to suit your system. It's not all about maybe the, the bottom line. It it, ha, it it has to marry in with, with, with your system. Barry, um quickly, um there's a question in here. Are are a smaller size cows able to calve the big Charlie calves without difficulty? So I think you mentioned we're bringing back your cow weight. Are you seeing any any issues there with, with ability to calve the fact that you're bringing your down cow weight? No, uh, definitely not, Adam. Um, it's, it's, it's probably easier, actually, to be honest. Uh, just picking your bones for your cows there, you have uh, 
Christen and Jason and a few others there, uh, Terminal and Charlie's. Uh, most of them, most of them would gather themselves. There's only a few you need a, a jack, you know, the few of the smaller cows, but uh, most of them, um, if you're watching the figures on the Charlie's, the Gavin and Index and their Gavinies, um, they're, they're, they're fine to calf. Okay, um, Daryl, I have one for you here. And I know if, if I started off working on a bit of farm program in the south um, many many years ago, I think it was 09, and if I look back to the 09 farmers that were in that better farm program, a lot of them are milking cows today. Let that be a, a negative or a positive, I don't know, of the better farm program, but the question has come in here, did any of the men think of going down the dairy route? So, so is that... Has that been an option, or, or are there any of the Better Farm program farmers over the last few years gone dairy and since they since they went into the program? Well, in this current tranche, there, there certainly has. Uh, you, um, even one farmer has has moved into dairy and he he is milking cows at the moment. Um, you can you can talk about why he done that, Adam, but being part of the program it really it really helped him understand the potential of his farm yes. i think he'd say that himself if you were talking to now to him now and the potential of his grassland of his farm um and it helped him maybe push to to make that decision yeah. um longer term i think there is other people maybe that from from the um uh, from previous phases that have went into it as as, as well like I, I think I genuinely think it's it's a positive, Daryl. I, I think if if a farmer can go to a certain point, that's the next step in terms of profitability. And, and if we if you have brought them to that point and given them the confidence to make that decision, um, that's absolutely a great success of the program. Is it worthwhile finishing cattle as a suckler to beef system with the meat factories paying the smaller producers a poorer price than bigger finishers and not having the economies of scale to buy straights? With the lorry load so this, that's a valid question i guess uh, is does it pay to go the full finishing route we've seen store prices in the mar at the moment really really expensive and would it pay just to bring a, an animal to a point and then offload it to a to a specialized finisher who can who can probably buy straights a lot easier and maybe get a better price as well at the other end okay adam there's always there's years you know when stores are, are crazy money and you know, you can look at it and, and think that there is a better margin in doing doing that there and selling at a certain point. However, respect to maybe what Francis said a wee bit, you know, we're sitting down at the start of the year here and we're doing plans in these farms and um, we, we have a lot of the costs, certainly the forage costs, all the silage costs spent on the farm already um, and we have to make that into a margin and that was based on finishing animals for a lot of the farm. Now, all right. You could argue that uh, that you could go out and sell that silage um, and bring some of that revenue back in, but uh, it's it's back to what Francis said: sticking at a system and, and taking the good years and the good times sometimes with the bad ones. Um, but if you, if you look at the the most recent Caffrey benchmarking as well, it would show that the the finishers. Are making a slightly better margin than the store people and the store people are making a slightly better margin than the weanling people still um yeah. so i'm not sure not too sure just um that it would but as you say there's from one year to the next from prices from one month to the next you can change yes. your mind but and, and that's not, that's not good either from me it's, it's not good from a v system point of view to be jumping from jimmy to jack every year or doing different things you, you better stay the course i think can't you yeah, yeah, um, certainly, and like, there's a couple of people here on, on the screen have been doing in, in the system now, you know, four or five years, um, and they're not chopping and changing, you know, and that speaks testament to me that they're sticking to the, the system. Cause... Final question, Daryl, um, in terms of the, the, the original, we'll say, programme farmers, I know maybe you haven't worked with them, but have they all sustained the high output and, we'll say, the, the, the high profitability of the, I'm sure you're following them, and I'm sure that, we'll say, Caffrey are following them, but are they all still, we'll say, doing, doing quite well in terms of the original plan that they, they set out on? It's, it's, it's a lot like the situation we just mentioned with the Darien. Um, not necessarily people moving into Darien, but when they've realised um, what their farm can do, um, they've maintained that at a high level and look to say, I, well, there's still space here. 
um, but I don't want any more than 100 cows for a labour point of view or X, Y and Z. So there's other enterprises coming on board onto the farm, which is adding overall farm gross margin and profit. So yeah, they have the majority of, of those that I know have stuck at it and improved further down the line, whether it's other enterprises that's added to the farm or, or whatnot, but they're still sticking to the to the system mainly. Um, a lot of people going down Oliver's line as well, um, of selling breeding heifers, you know, and maybe changing a, a wee bit for that there and trying to get more heifers in the ground, as you said, with Tullamore Farm. Just looking at the farm and, you know, trying to see where they can move it on to the next next step. Okay, Daryl, um, thanks very much for that. Look, I'm going to bring tonight to a close. Um, just a few thank yous to, 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 to make. Um, look, I'd like to thank all the programme participants, um, not just the farmers that took part tonight, but a special thanks to them for joining us tonight. Obviously, the strength of any technical programme is in the farmers um, that participate and, and put themselves you know, out there. Um, and all the farmers in the programme deserve huge credit for that. Um, I'd like to thank the programme advisors, um, Daryl um, and uh, Francis. Um, huge dedication and huge work uh, goes in behind the scenes to, to bring these farmers and to work with these farmers and bring people along with you. And that's a huge part of the job is to make people believe in, in you and, and, and make them come with you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the programme partners and, share, and, and stakeholders, uh, CAFRI, ABP and the Irish Farmers Journal without whom the programme uh, wouldn't have been such a success. And, and look, I suppose to sum up tonight, um, it's it's the good technical performance pays and, and, and the farmers are a testament to that. Justin McCarthy talked in last week's paper about the three Ps, or four Ps actually in profit. Um, and that's an important point to remember, price, payments, performance and production. Um, we, we always maybe talk about price uh, and we talk about payments, but we sometimes forget about performance and production. Um, look, we in the Irish Farmers Journal we, we remain extremely passionate about the Suckler Cow and improving profitability on suckler farms and technical performance along with that supports um you know it's, it's key to that um we've invested in our demo farm in tullamore uh, which is now running 100 cows and 250 yos and continue to fly the flag uh, for beef farms you can catch up uh, on all the weekly coverage on our livestock pages and farmersjournal.ie um our next webinar takes place live from tullamore farm on tuesday the 23rd of march at eight o'clock where, where darren carty and sean diver uh, we'll be in the middle of Laman, hopefully, um, and we'll be delighted if you could join us for that. For anyone that missed any of tonight's webinar, you can watch it back on www.afj.ie forward slash webinar. Thank you all for watching. Stay safe, safe farming, and good night. <laughs>